I go by Bruce for any complaints. <laughs> and I'll go by Bill for any uh, positive things. No. Uh, so Bill Campy, I'm with DTJ Design. We're an architecture planning and landscape, landscape architecture uh, company out of Boulder. I've been doing work in, uh, our company been, has been doing work that I've been involved with uh, in Breckenridge for about 10 years now. Um, so I've been kind of involved in this community for a long time. It's kind of my second home in Colorado. Um, to give a sense of where we are in the process, Shannon talked about next steps. I kind of want to remind ourselves of where we've been uh, at this point. Uh, Nelson Nygaard, DTJ Design, were hired in December, January timeframe. Spent a lot of time up, up here during that time uh, observing, observing things ourselves. Additionally, we've also had a uh, community meeting, council, staff meetings, and we've been essentially doing some research through this period of time, right? Uh, as part of that, we've kind of come back into now the design process, right? So we've done this kind of research piece. We've read a lot of the previous uh, studies. Now we're in the point of now talking about how we might start moving forward. And, and the reason we need this community meeting to, to kind of move our process forward is to get your input. So we're going to put everybody to work today, you know, Hope everybody's work gloves and some boots, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, help us make some decisions. Now, the decisions we're making today are not necessarily this or that. Oftentimes, they're gonna be more about priority, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, the cool thing about Breckenridge is uh, when we enter this project, um, we were we were certainly concerned about the opportunities we might have to improve this community. It's it's a worldwide recognized community. Uh, Breckenridge is oftentimes considered. Uh, what other communities want to be. So when I you know, kind of brought Nelson Nygaard to the table, they said, oh shoot, well we use Breckenridge as our kind of standard. How are we going to improve that place, you know? And, and so uh, we were excited as we went through this process, we were to find um, kind of incremental low-hanging fruit items and maybe some big ideas that will help kind of uh, support some of the initiatives that we heard that were really important. So to get to those, we heard basically we had hundreds and hundreds of comments, right? Uh, but we were able to distill those down to kind of three big ideas, just to kind of keep this simple for this process. And the first one was create a better guest or user experience. Now, guest in this term means oftentimes it's a resident, oftentimes it's an out-of-town employee, uh, it could be a day skier, it could be a destination skier, or a summer visitor, right? So this really encompasses a lot of folks. Uh, and, it, and it means a lot of things. It means that sitting uh, in traffic for 45 minutes and going a block is not a positive guest experience. Uh, trying to walk to town core, which is where people want to be in, the, in, in Breckenridge, on an icy slope in the dark, when I've never been here before, is not a great guest experience. Uh, wanting to ride the bus, but not knowing when it's going to arrive and where it goes. It, so this, this idea really encompasses a lot of the, the issues we were hearing um, come up. Reduce traffic congestion and focus on Park Avenue. So what we've learned is that Park Avenue is kind of this linchpin. Um, because transit so heavily relies on Park Avenue, because the, the, um, so much of the bed base kind of stems off of Park Avenue, so much of the skier parking stems off of Park Avenue, that when Park Avenue stops working, much of the infrastructure in town stops working, both for cars moving through and the bus system. So when the bus system isn't reliable, people aren't going to use it. So all of these pieces start to kind of interconnect. And then the last uh, kind of big idea that we kind of heard was increase access to downtown business. Or maybe even just downtown might be the right way to say that. So essentially, you know, the downtown of Breckenridge is really what the, the brand kind of is to the people outside of it. And when they come here, and it includes actually people internal too, people want to be downtown. You know, that's where, that's where you want to go. Ski the mountains, spend your rest of your time, you know, in the town core. And so access to that means a lot of things. Uh, it means, you know, be able to park and actually get to the place I want to go. It means be able to walk if I really want to walk. It means using transit if I want to be able to get there. And so um, those, are the, those kind of big ideas really encompassed a lot of what we were learning about uh, Breckenridge. And Bill, uh, before you start in your presentation, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one is our presentation, as it often is, is super dense. Uh, you'll, you'll not be able to see all the little things on the screen. Uh, so the entire presentation will be available on the project website tomorrow for you to download and look at in detail. We'll, we're also having a few copies printed this evening. So for those of you who want to really focus, you can have some paper hard copies. Um, the other thing is that once we're done with the presentation, what we really want is to hear a lot from you, particularly to help us make the difficult choices. So you've seen the 
the posters that are on the side walls, these are uh, left over from the same workshop we just gave this morning. That's really the bulk of the exercise this evening, is for you to help us figure out how to prioritize, how, what to emphasize first, um, and how to make difficult choices with limited resources. So after we go through the presentation, we're gonna uh, divide up into three groups and really have some uh, good discussion with all of you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And I think one thing to note as I go through these, there's this presentation is divided in kind of three stages. The first uh, stage is gonna be some of the things that aren't in conflict, we feel, with other choices. So it's almost like if you were to call it the no-brainers, right? So we know, for example, that the Blue River Corridor has been improved in certain areas and it's really helped kind of reinforce the brand of Breckenridge, having this great river corridor that's accessible by people or great for fishing now. Um, those are huge improvements, but we know there's gaps in it. So that might be something that needs to be done. It's part of kind of uh, the core um, and it doesn't really conflict with where we might want to increase parking, for example. And then there's other choices we're going to have about what we want to do first and what we might want to do later and where we might want to locate um, additional parking or, or you know, uh, alternative transportation systems. So we'll go through that. Um, speaking of the Blue River Corridor, here it is. So enhancing the Blue River Corridor does a lot of things. One, it's an amenity in town that, that should be um, utilized at its utmost uh, capacity. Uh, two, the river, what we've learned, is really a divider, right? So the river is kind of where the, the downtown Main Street environment starts to kind of end and the out of town uh, uh, parking areas or whatever might begin. And one of the things we heard quite a bit is for both residents and guests uh, that we really want people within the, the town core area to feel like they're in town. You know? So if you're in the gondolots, for example, which is a great deal of your visitors on a, on a daily basis, you don't feel like you're in town. And part of that is the river is a divider. So improving that would be a, a big incentive. Another piece is the, the, the trail corridor through there. There's a missing piece linkage. We should think about how that gets connected. Again, not in conflict with anything, kind of something that's been talked about in town for a long time. It needs to be part of some of the initiatives that we have in plan. So wayfinding. Uh, one of the challenges we've had uh, when we think about how people move through town and, and encouraging them not drive you know, across the street essentially when they could just walk is they're not sure how to get to downtown from some of the major bed base areas. Um, Park Avenue, uh, just like the river, is a major divider uh, and that's where a lot of the bed base is that want to be kind of coming into the town core. So some of the traffic or, trans or uh, tr um, uh, parking issues you have essentially are from people driving a block, circulating around when they could have probably walked there in one-tenth of the time that it took them to do all of that. So having some wayfinding elements, there's some existing wayfinding in place, maybe improving some of that, um, uh, maintaining that better, providing better lighting in those areas, and telling people where they can actually get across the park would be an important piece about that. The ski back. Uh, the ski back's a, a great amenity. It does take you all the way from the mountain all the way into town. Uh, but there's a little bit of a kind of disconnect when you arrive at it, right? So you get there, you have to go downstairs through a tunnel, upstairs, and then you get to a kind of a dirt parking environment. So how do we make that feel like you, maybe you can ski into the tunnel, maybe there's actually an escalator coming up, or maybe somehow the stairs are a little bit better, and then when you actually arrive in the parking lot, maybe it's actually an arrival experience versus, oh, I'm kind of in this dirt parking area. So. Um, where's my car so I can get out of here? So how do we you know, kind of utilize that access to town and make it feel like you're skiing into town? Because you are. Uh, the Main Street Network idea. So there's a lot of stuff we saw as far as lighting, connectivity, narrow sidewalks that were plowed over with snow, um, steep hill uh, sidewalks that, that kind of were hard to walk on. Uh, that, that were kind of concerns for us if we were really to, to encourage or increase the amount of pedestrian traffic in town. So. We came up with this idea called the Main Street Network. Main Street and all the improvements that have been done on that street have been quite successful. Uh, it's now a place where pedestrians and cars alike can kind of work together. If you're in a car, you kind of know you're going to go pretty slow. You kind of know you better be looking for people because people are going to kind of cross that street because they feel comfortable. And that's a sign of successful pedestrian car mixed environment in a very slow moving case. Now Main Street is not park. Park's the kind of way to get through town. Main Street's the way to kind of be part of town. And so how do we increase that network in a sense that now we're creating a number of streets that maybe are a little bit more walkable, maybe there's sidewalks that are, are wide enough that if we have to plow the streets, it doesn't cover the sidewalk. Uh, maybe there's a little more intense maintenance program to make sure at least one side of the road 
is snow free, ice free year round. So that now we're saying, okay, if we want you to walk down four o'clock in the dark at night, you have good lighting, uh, it's wide enough, it's dry, it's actually pavement. Um, and then it's, so it's a reasonable request, you know. Um, and then all of a sudden, because the truth is when you're on vacation, the last thing you really want to do is drive in the snow and in the weather and deal with trying to find a parking spot. If you could just find a way to get to where you want to go in a shorter, easier time, and it's easily understood, understood by the physical environment, right? So the physical environment reinforces those kind of desires. And we see people now on Village and four o'clock walking in miserable conditions. So you can only imagine how many people would walk if the conditions were made better. Also, there's some kind of disconnects internally off street for pedestrians. So uh, the Gondolas is a great example of a place where we have a great group of uh, uh, possible kind of people feeling they could be in town. Right now, it has this, the physical environment does not tell you you're part of uh, of the town of Breckenridge. When you're in, on Main Street, the physical environment clearly says you're at a place. So how do we increase uh, maybe some pedestrian ways, maybe there's some landscaping, maybe there's lighting, maybe it's you know, brick paving, maybe it's almost like a pedestrian street that might go through those environments, connect to the gondola, connect to the ski back, connect to town, in a way that says, oh, okay, this is a place to go, right? Um, versus, okay, I've already arrived at my car, I'm leaving. Um, there's, as part of that kind of experience, one of the things that we've noticed is that when you're in the gondolots and you want to walk into town, you kind of try to find where the break in, the, in all the snow is, and then you kind of angle down some weird stairs or a path, then you cross a river that's not quite a river, and then you go through two parking lots. And then eventually you arrive at Main Street, and you're like, oh, okay, this is what they said was going to be here. I've, I've endured the journey. So the, the idea of so Wellington lot, which is a valuable parking space, we understand that. So how do we, you know, we'll talk about parking a little bit later, but currently there's a park across the street. What about creating a, almost like a park gateway into downtown along Main Street? And then people, now you're walking through maybe a, a, a more improved river corridor, maybe a better pedestrian wayfinding experience, and maybe a, a park connection. So now we've extended some of the amenity or some of the character of downtown up into some of the places we're asking people to kind of engage our town saying, hey, you know, if, if, if you want me to feel like I'm in town, you know, make me feel like I'm in town. Skier services building. So in the current Gondolots master plan, there's a skier services building um, kind of as part of the idea to help uh, uh, support um, skiers and visitors to Breckenridge around the gondola area. We think that's a great idea. We think there's op op opportunities to expand that into uh, having maybe more skier uh, uh, storage. So the idea here would be, if we have people parking, let's say remote, which a lot of people do, uh, get bussed in, or we have people in the gondola lots, what's the main thing that's frustrating about skiing, right? It's all the stuff. If you're not on the snow with it on you, and you're carrying it, it's not super a great idea to kind of, oh, well, I'm gonna walk around Main Street with my skis. That's probably not gonna happen, right? So then you're gonna take it to your car. As soon as you get to your car, you're starting about thinking about getting in your car and probably going somewhere else. And so the idea would be, let's engage the opportunity of having this great group of people either coming down the ski back or coming off the gondola or coming from the remote lots and, and give them a place that also is welcoming in the morning but it also welcoming in the evening where you might be able to ski, uh, store your, your skis and boots, maybe change into some walking boots. And here's, here's the great idea, it's free because you go and get it validated downtown because you actually have engaged downtown. So, um, there's opportunities to kind of start changing this experience for, for the people that are in our town. And again, kind of reaching our, 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 what's magic about town out into the place where a lot of the people are that we want to feel like they are in town for, because what they really don't realize is that they're just a, a, a minute walk away from a great place. Uh, Park Avenue, so Park Avenue, as I said, is the linchpin to this project uh, in terms of how we get traffic to move again and transit to work for real in town at those peak moments in time. So there's a couple different ideas out there for park that might be incremental. Uh, one of the ideas is to have a, kind of a continuous system of roundabouts versus half roundabouts, half lights. What we do know, and if you, you all know this better than I do, when you're on park and you get caught at a light, that's what slows and backs things up and then it just continues to happen that way. And so you're kind of doing this stop, start, stop, start activity. Um, if you have a roundabout and that light backs up into that roundabout, the roundabout stops functioning. So, the idea of having a series of roundabouts allows the road to work in a kind of a continuous, maybe slow, but continuous movement. It also provides for pedestrians, there's opportunities with those roundabouts to have clear pedestrian crossings. So for example, 
uh, my favorite street to pick on, 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, there is no light. Uh, there's a crosswalk. Sure, it's painted on the road, but it's also covered by two inches of snow and ice year round, you know, all winter. And so you're not sure about crossing that. Cars coming down the road have no idea that that's there, except for there's a small sign that you may or may not be able to see. So if there's a roundabout there, though, with a place where you cross only one lane of traffic, have a bit of refuge, and cross another lane of traffic that's slow moving, now all of a sudden pedestrians start to understand how they can get across that road in a real meaningful way and not feel like they have to dart out into the dark street and hope that the suburban that's, that's coming up can slam on its brakes and stop in time. So there's things like that that we feel that we can really um, support. In the meantime, there's, there's uh, small things. For example, at Park and Main, if we were to time a pedestrian signal with that light, where uh, essentially when the crosswalk says walk across the light, the pedestrian crossing, which is now manned by about 10 different people at a time, can now be timed to the intersection and they can cross together and then it's not stopping traffic because they're already stopping seeing that there's a red light. So even before the roundabouts happen, we're thinking about ways to move people across uh, the street. And maybe even in some mid-block places where you only, we can put a pedestrian kind of island uh, area of zone of safety, so you can only have to cross one lane of traffic at a time and not have to kind of dart across that wide. It's, it's only two lanes of traffic, but it's a fairly wide kind of street and it's kind of odd that way. So. Well, the interesting thing about overpasses and, and tunnels, and this is kind of similar to what we've experienced with the ski back here, is that if I can see, for example, if Park Avenue is about as wide as this, this wall to this wall, and I can do that, uh, most people over time has shown that well, they'll take the chance of walking across the street then go upstairs or downstairs over a bridge and back down again. It just, it's that calculation of, well, I just want to go right there. And so oftentimes people tend to do that. Um, it, excuse me? Well, I think every circumstance is going to be a little different because you may have to, you may have to get, well, I think they're looking at one. Do you want to talk about what we're talking about for the... So, and every, every situation is going to be different based on ownership of property and those kinds of things. So, um, I'll say about these improvements, you know, this is probably something that you're not going to do all at once, all of these things. It's going to be over time um, and incremental. But what we've learned is Breckenridge is a complicated enough place that there's no real silver bullet answer, right? Because it, there's, all these things are tied together. Uh, as I talked about with park, for example, transit's tied to park, pedestrian movement across is tied to park, uh, and then movement just on park is, of course, <laughs> tied to park. And so if we have uh, uh, continuous movement on park, it helps with transit. If we have opportunities for um, roundabouts and pedestrians to cross, then people are out of their cars, which maybe takes cars off park, which helps park move better. And we'll talk a little bit about some, some of the statistics about how that looks. So um, those are the things that we've kind of say, those all make sense to do over time. And one of our tasks ultimately will be you look at cost-benefit analysis and how this gets, gets phased over time. That will be part of our um, implementation plan. So what are we doing in 2017 when the money becomes available? Um, or what do we need to you know, assign for capital expenditure to start making some of these improvements right away? And what might be a 2018, 2019, 2020 initiative? So um, we'll have to talk about that. There's other, three different design strategies we have. They're really centered around a couple different ideas, or three different ideas. One, if we're going to add parking in town, where might it want to be uh, to be the best benefit um, for the community uh, and our guests? Two, if we're going to think about transit as, a, as a something we want to promote in town, because you know if we can promote transit, we can get cars off the road, and some of the car functions can actually work better, and transit can work better. Uh, what alternative systems we can, can we use? Uh, the gondola system seems to be a, quite a um, unique um, transit option um, in all communities, not just ski communities. You're seeing that getting applied to a lot of urban environments now because the actual cost of that infrastructure compared to uh, lots of road expansion, adding lanes, um, adding other types of transit, uh, it's actually pretty cost effective that way, surprisingly. Um, it actually can move a lot of people very quickly. If you've ever had to ride the gondola up to the mountain, you've seen that line wrapping and wrapping and wrapping around, and you think, I'm going to be down here for an hour waiting in line, and then in 10 minutes you're on the gondola. It's pretty remarkable how, how fast those can move people through. So 
And then the third thing is the, the, the question of affordable housing in the town core. So one of the things we're, we're asking the community to weigh in on is would we consider building affordable housing um, somewhere in the town core and, and using some of the town property for that use? Because affordable housing not only solves some of the employee um, kind of um, resident needs, but it also takes cars off the road. If you're already in town, um, you don't need to go drive your car to wherever, you're right there. If there's other, if the transit system's working and you're in town, you have access to other um, ways to get around because you're right there versus having to drive in from out of town. So it actually saves quite a few trips um, to have more people living in town that would otherwise be have to drive into town. So uh, this first idea is called intercept lots. So um, this is the idea that we um, say, okay, additional skier, uh, day skier parking or visitor parking, um, Really, if we're going to expand that capacity, we should be expanding on the edge of town. Now, this makes sense for a lot of reasons in terms of traffic, right? So I'm capturing the cars on the outside of town. It makes sense to keep the cars off of our, keep the cars out of our street system as much as possible if we're having all these traffic issues today. Knowing that we're adding lodging units in the town, there's a number of parcels that are going to be developed. That's going to come with people living there, but it's also going to come with employees having to get there. So how do we start to accommodate some of the expansion in places that we know are not going to affect our traffic or won't affect our traffic as much. Well, if we're going to do that, we sure as heck better be able to create a great guest experience from those places So, um, because that's one of our primary things. Um, how can we do that? Well, the idea of maybe a gondola, they actually connect to the existing gondola, gondola system, um, seems to be a, a fairly viable option. Uh, the cost of building a gondola compared to some other infrastructure costs are, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, less. Uh, it's a, you don't have to sit and wait in the cold. As you know, you can step right on it. We're adding a lot of people out in this area. So this is not just for skiers. This could be a, a transit system for all that affordable housing that's getting built, um, both on Block 11 and, uh, and you know, Breck Terrace and all those other places out there. So this could actually be something you'd be able to walk to, maybe have a couple stops. Uh, you can even add stops at like the rec center and other places. So you know, we're, think of the gondola not as a way to go skiing, but actually as a way to get around. And how, what would that open up for us for possibilities? And this would preserve the, the highest valued, highest kind of use properties in town for other uses possibly besides additional parking. How do those costs compare to just running the transit system much more frequently? You know, like steamboats, when you come 10 minutes running their buses, and it becomes a no-brainer to take the bus because <laughs> So figure about $300,000 a year in operating cost per bus, uh, and then depending upon the distance the bus needs to run, um, it, it quickly adds up. So that's, but that's exactly the sort of question that we want to ask, is what's the most cost-effective mix of investments across all modes of transportation in order to meet the full needs of the town? You know, rather than simply saying, yep, we're going to build parking, or nope, we're only going to do a gondola, or all we're going to do is bike lanes. We want to look at the full mix and do an actual cost-benefit analysis. And that might be a lot about how we phase this out too, right? So we might be able to build on small, low-hanging fruit that starts not, and we'll show you the percentages, starts taking away these percentages of traffic on the roads, then allow us to, and then when we get <coughs> growth or other influx, we can make some bigger moves possibly. So there's a, that whole conversation. And, and some of that conversation is going to be about just character. What's the town want to be, you know? do we? You know, how, what, what does it say to have a gondola as a transportation system about, about the town? So there's some questions about that, too. Um, so kind of the strategy, too. And I'll, I'll say one of the things that you'll see is uh, these, these aren't necessarily at conflict with each other. So they're just different approaches, if that makes sense. For example, if we were to do the intercept lots, it doesn't preclude us building a parking structure on F lot, right? It might delay that, or it might change how many spots we put on that. But um, it doesn't say you can't do that. It just says that that's where our first priority or our first initiative might be. I'm sorry, you had a question? Yeah, could you go back and just explain where the gondola is? I assume... Oh, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, it's, I know it's hard to see for everyone, but the idea here would be we'd have some kind of gondola system that would connect somewhere out in there. It could be more towards the school. It could be more towards CMC. We're not sure about that. The number of stops along the way, we'd have to kind of study that in depth. One of the great things is most of that corridor, the river corridor, is owned by the town, so we would have some way to get through there. And then we connect here, and then of course this is the current gondola routing up to the mountain. Um, kind of 
currently. We're also suggesting you might do an enhanced transit system in there as well. Um, and, and you would have to play that off. The idea is if you build a gondola, you might not need as many buses out there, so there should be some offset costs as well. <coughs> I, I, an on-grade kind of train system, essentially. So we, we could do that. That would require dedicated right-of-way. So we'd effectively need a new road for the trolley to operate in, because if the trolley is stuck in traffic on park with everyone else, it's not going to it's not going to do as much good, right? So it's it's a uh, the at-grade solutions are a little bit challenging unless we do more radical things to eliminate traffic congestion in town, which we can talk about in a bit if you want. Yeah. So that's one of the great things about a gondola is that it is independent of your traffic system. So as you know, the buses can't move if they're stuck in traffic. And so yep. the gondola will be moving and almost independent of that. And they have a pretty good maintenance um, kind of record as far as consistency and all those kinds of things. So. We might. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for that introduction to this. Uh, sure. It can it can it can be a factor in Breckenridge, as we all know, um, and it can it has stopped the gondola for periodic points in time. But um, so it is it is a factor. But the the current gondola system has been pretty consistent in its running and not had that be kind of a major detriment. But right, unfortunately we'd be at a low elevation, so hopefully hopefully, we'd be out of the highest wind shear areas. Yeah. Um, so in regards to another idea, again, that we're showing a number of different kind of ideas for how we might use a gondola as a transportation system in town. Uh, just like I mentioned with parking, they're not independent of each other, they're just kind of different options on how we might think about the initial kind of pass at it. So this would be to say, well, we're really going to bring people back into town. Um, East Sawmill lot is a town-owned property. It's right at Main and Main, essentially, if everybody's familiar with what that property is. It's, it's essentially, um, it's the lots just, if you're on Main Street and Ski Hill Road, it's just behind, um, towards Gondola lots in that area right there. Right um, on the Those river. linear parking areas, and then the town actually owns the property adjacent on Ski Hill there. Uh, so. That could be a, a pretty interesting solution. It could be a gateway building. We could design it in a way that's a gateway into town. It's right there um, as far as parking, but we have some consideration to make about that. We are, for every spot you put in that garage, you have to assume that's at least one car, if not multiple, depending on turnover on the road, right? Or else why are you building it? <laughs> so you have to assume that you're gonna put people in it, particularly on your busiest of days. So we're really trying to say how much um, if we do all these things, and you'll see the improvements we can make by doing pedestrian improvements and transit improvements, uh, uh, roundabouts, and decrease the amount of traffic on park, we might be adding some back if we start adding parking capacity in the town core. And we just have to recognize that. And maybe that's still what we want to do. But we need to make sure we understand those offsets. So this would be a great location. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a kind of interesting configuration. So we have to consider that in the design um, and, and the size of the structure. Uh, because of where it is, but that would be a way to access town, have parking in town. It would, have, it would still keep some of our other lots available for whether we wanted to add affordable housing on F-Lot or some other place. Uh, and then it, from a gondola, gondola routing uh, concept, uh, we're considering the idea of does a gondola become a connector from even from the mountain down through town and back up and really become this kind of integrated system to the town core. Uh, therefore, if you can imagine somebody uh, getting down with their ski day, continue on the gondola, um, once they've stored their skis for uh, free uh, at the skier services building, heading down to Maine, having dinner or drink or whatever they wanted to have, and then walking Main Street back, for example. And you, you see that a lot in other, other uh, kind of resort environments uh, where you kind of, well, you see it here. It's called take the bus up to Breckenridge and coast your bike down to Frisco. <laughs> um, that's kind of a similar idea to get the experience. Uh, and then, of course, riding the gondola above the, well, the beautifully lit Main Street might be a pretty neat thing to do. We know people today ride the gondola as an, as an attraction or activity. Well, my suspicion is it would be seasonal. Um, you might not run it in the shoulder seasons, for example. You might run it only on weekends in the summer. So you would have to, 
The great thing is, you know, you can turn it on and off. You can understand how that lives and, and adapt kind of its use per when you're getting the best ridership um, or the, the kind of best benefit to the town out of that. Um, you don't have to run it all the time, obviously. Yes, I think you have a question. Two quick questions. When you describe an element on the screen, can you actually touch the screen? Sure. Sorry, I know. That's a great comment. So this would be the gondola outing in red. Um, uh, the parking area, so if this is right here, Ski Hill heading up, uh, Main Street, so here's where the sawmill location is, actually. And then this is the Riverwalk uh, Center, um, kind of the Blue River Plaza, so that's where we were thinking, or possibly maybe an f -lot area somewhere in this region where you'd want to have the other gondola stop at another kind of important place. That would also help for when you have, uh, in summer events, for example, around that core area, there's typically often parking, except for, of course, Fourth of July weekend. Um, in, in the Gondola Lots area, and it provides that parking access to the town via a pretty interesting journey. Thank you. Would you recommend Saint Kilo to the uh, hockey rink? So, uh, <laughs> I haven't paid anybody to, to do this for me, but I appreciate that you've asked that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, our last I, uh, uh, kind of uh, idea would be to uh, continue with the, the direction of F-lot parking structure, um, connect the gondola from the ice rink over possibly to that location. Again, you still could connect over to the other gondola, but this is just another idea on routing if you were to do one route. Uh, and then maybe even up to the mountain from there. Uh, there is a precedent for gondolas being on top of parking structures, for example. Uh, one of the nice things about this is it eliminate a lot of the conflict with pedestrians uh, in that area, which we know is a, a challenge because you'd be able to access the mountain from that place. But, ag but again, recognize that the further we get towards this part of town, um, we know that's where the traffic uh, issues start. And so the more people we're pulling into that, again, for every spot we have, we need to assume at least one trip, if not multiple, we're pulling into that, that area. So we have to be very careful about how much we can offset, um, how much growth we expect, and, and how much kind of congestion we're, we're willing to accept on Park Avenue to provide more parking in the town core, for example. Yeah, yes. We have a lot of traffic coming in yeah. from the south. That's true. That's very true, and it seems to be increasing um, in my experience than when I, when I was here from ten years ago. What, what percent comes from the south versus north? We we don't know, and I was just in a meeting where they're going to start counting that um, pretty soon here. I think there's actually discussions with Blue River to try to get. Um, some type of monitoring system coordinated with them where they can start monitoring that south uh, more specifically and compare. So they just don't have the same kind of uh, monitoring that we have coming in from the north to, to determine that. It's a, obviously a good question. So. Yes? Yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I, I can talk a little bit about, so a lot of the work we do, we kind of base on precedence and history on that. And, and you know, in the 60s and 70s, there's a lot of attention paid to taking streets and turning them into pedestrian-only environments. Um, over time, the, the truth is, is that those have not been successful, and the retail businesses really struggled with that. Um, and a lot, almost all of them have brought the car back in. And what's interesting, if you're maybe familiar with Pearl Street Mall, just because it's local and accessible for a lot of people and known, is that it's a pedestrian environment uh, for actually a very short amount of that mall, right? So as it continues to uh, the west, it becomes car again, and, and it's still a very successful pedestrian environment. But there's cars that can cross it at every block, and there's still a visual access, and those blocks are quite short, 350 feet. So um, from a professional opinion, and I think Jeff would, would, would agree with me, having this kind of car experience, ability to kind of see what Main Street is and experience that and have access to that and visual access to retail and restaurants and know kind of what it's about through a car experience and not, not kind of close it off is pretty, pretty important to um, most retail environments and commercial environments. And I actually would argue it's important to Breckenridge because Breckenridge has this kind of historic, really cool street grid system that I would hate to kind of lose uh, because I think it's actually kind of almost kind of part of the historic nature of the place. Now, now that said, we actually are really enthusiastic about building upon the success that the town has had in closing off Maine, 
periodically for special events. Oh yeah, sure, right? of, course, you know, of course. When you got a, enough people here in order to really activate the full width of Main Street, that's fantastic. And so thinking about ways of building in the ability to close off Main when you've got something to fill it with, including you know, putting in the electrical outlets, putting in the water hookups, so that you could have a farmer's market there, you can have a concert for an hour at lunchtime there, where the bollards just pop up, the musicians go out, the bollards you know, pop back down, the cars go back into place. Those sorts of th uh, strategies can be wildly successful. Yeah. There's been hundreds of attempts. Uh, there are only five remaining, what I would call successful examples of pedestrian malls in North America. And they're all in much denser places than Breckenridge. Well, Denver's not really pedestrian because it's full of vehicles. Yes, no, 16th Street is full of vehicles. Like, you know, there's a bus every, you know, 30 seconds practically, right? But, you know, so Lincoln Road in Miami is another example. Lincoln Road in, my, in uh, 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 South Beach in, in Miami uh, is successful, although it struggled for a long time. It's yeah. finally succeeding. It took 30 years to succeed, and it's finally doing it. Um, uh, Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica is another example, but you know, it's, uh, it's o over an order of magnitude more people than here. How about Carl Street in Boulder? Yeah, yeah, that was already mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. But it also struggled for a while, but it, it is one of those, it's one of those examples. Uh, go ahead. Well, that would certainly provide more access as far as kind of visually to understand what that is. I, I would just say, that, as Jeff said, it, it's literally, it's it just, there's something about in, in, in the United States, the idea of that kind of, I mean, I, I, I've come to Breckenridge, I don't even know how many hundreds of days in the last 10 years, but there's plenty of occasions where I say, I'm just going to drive down Main Street and see what's going on. Um, and I think there's that kind of uh, just natural, kind of want and need to kind of go through that experience and then park my car and then get back and kind of go see what it's about afterwards. And, and that, again, just there was a massive movement and it's really in, in some really wonderful places that um, really actually saw a, ma a great decline in their, in their viability because of it and then had to rebuild and we worked that back um, because other places have done that. And so even in the new, the new developments, brand new spanking uh, urban, you know, Belmars of the world, um, Denver, they're, they're making sure the car is a slow moving part of the, of, the, of the story and not kind of dominant. What's great about Main Street today is that there is cars, but they're not, they're not speeding through, um, you know, maybe well, when it, it's packed. Right now there might be because there's not many people on the road, but it, it seems to be a working environment in, in the most densest of times. Um, it works okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, to answer the first question, we haven't designed any of this yet. This is in, a, in kind of, we need to pick the things we're going to actually design. So I can't tell you how tall it'd have to be to understand that through that corridor. We have to look at that. We need to understand that the community is interested before we kind of go through and start really hardcore engineering that piece. So I don't have a good sense for height at this point, I guess is my, my point. Uh, as far as the lift tax, you know, we would have, I don't have a super 100% complete understanding on the entirety of what that can, can be funded or not fund. I think certainly some of these things, improving the river corridor, I suspect would not be funded by that. So there's some things there probably would have to be capital improvements and some things that would have to be lift tax improvements. I know that the, the, the lift tax uh, piece is supposed to be for transit, transportation, traffic, parking, support. And so we, uh, we're, when we do our uh, priorities and kind of phasing, I think we're gonna have to consider what funding mechanisms are there and that will be a part of that prioritization you know if it's coming out of the general fund there'll be different 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 ideas
Right, and both operating in capital, which is really beneficial. So we, we can think about life cycle costing rather than being forced to overbuild because the capital money is free, but the operating money is expensive. So um, we've got these kind of ideas. We have these kind of uh, improvements we want to make. So what's that do for our community? I think uh, based on historical evidence, some of these other modeling, We've talked about earlier that the idea was that there probably isn't a silver bullet for Breckenridge, right? There's these incremental improvements that we're going to have to make that every 1% gets us closer to that 5 to 10% where we start to feel a massive difference in traffic congestion. Uh, and then, of course, there's all these other pieces that talk to um, how we can access our parking when we need to and all these other things. And so, as you can see here, uh, each different idea starts to get kind of how much, how many cars is this taking off the road, how much percentage of increment are we growing, and um, kind of what, what are the improvements gaining for us empirically for the town. I'd like, you know, Jeff's going to talk a little bit about this, and, the, and particularly I think the TDM uh, initiatives are really kind of interesting. That's right. So, so as Bill said, there's no silver bullet. We're taking a silver buckshot approach. But keep in mind that, uh, keep, keep in mind that the, in order to address the congestion problem, we don't need to get everyone out of their cars. We need to get about 10% of people out of their cars. 10% is the margin between free flow traffic and gridlock. So we don't have that huge of a problem to solve. And of the things that we've talked about, we think we can solve the problem. It's just going to require a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, different investments. So, and our task is to figure out what's the highest priority. What do we do first? I guess I don't really understand that 10% figure. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't think that 10% of taking 10% of the cars out of that is even a point of density. The so, only way you can get across is if you've got a pedestrian crossing there. So if you, if you change the rate at which cars try to enter onto park and you back that rate off by 10% and you really actually back it off and hold all of it by 10%, yeah, park will flow smoothly again. So you've all experienced this on the highway where you're driving down the interstate and you know, traffic's flowing smoothly and it's getting a little bit denser, it's getting a little bit denser, and you're like, you're no longer going 75 or kind of going 65 or 55, and then all of a sudden traffic grinds to a halt, right? That difference between, yeah, it's like, it's thick, but I'm still going, you know, 45 miles an hour to like, it's bumper to bumper and things are not moving, that is a 10% difference or less. So this problem is not hard to solve, but it requires many different investments. Uh, because each of the solutions, you know, sort of shaves off a percentage or two. And it requires thinking very carefully about parking, which we will get to in a second. So we already talked about some of the transit ideas, including uh, we have some ideas for streamlining, for reconfiguring the, the free ride, which is really wildly successful in its current form. We think it could be even better. Uh, we haven't really talked much about biking, which we've, we've been hearing a lot more about. You know, Breckenridge is the kind of place that could support a bike share program. And with fat, tired bikes, it could support biking for all of those short trips uh, year round. Uh, you know, one of the things that's remarkable here is that we keep focusing on the long trip from Denver or from Dallas into town, not recognizing that the vast majority of trips are actually very short in-town trips. In fact, there's a lot of trips that are apparently about a half a mile. Those are the trips that are easiest to change, not the ones coming up from Denver. Um, they're also the sort of trips that would benefit all of you, because they might provide you with some better choices for getting around town. So little improvements to the bike system, cost-effective, and create interesting co-benefits about Breckenridge as a great place to be. The same is true with pedestrian investments. It might be a lot cheaper to widen the sidewalk on the north side of 4 o'clock in order to make it easier for the folks who live up 4 o'clock to be able to walk into town year-round than to drive the half a mile and fill, fill up a parking space in town, right? Then it is to build more parking in order to accommodate those half-mile trips. So thinking about pedestrian improvements as not only a way of making the town better, but as a way of saving money on parking structure construction. The places that really give us benefit are uh, thinking about both parking management and where we place parking supply. 
We don't have good data on this, but our observations suggest that the bulk of the traffic on Main Street and a significant amount of the traffic on Park is people driving around in circles trying to find a damn parking space, right? I mean, it's, it is really difficult to find parking if your destination is downtown Breckenridge. Uh, and that's pretty much year round, but it's especially bad in the peak season. Um, and that is because parking management here is backward, right? You charge for parking in the least desirable spaces, but the most desirable spaces are free. And there's been this concern that we've heard a lot about, about somehow charging for parking on Main Street going against town character. Well, I would argue actually that being stuck in severe traffic congestion and having to drive around in circles, that's not the town character that you want. And that we can actually look at more modern technologies for managing parking, including pay by cell phone, where you don't actually have to put in stupid quarters into a 1930s parking meter, uh, where uh, you can have the parking meter uh, send you a text to ask if you want more time, where you can, your cell phone device could allow you to validate your parking at any merchant, um, where the parking uh, could be discounted if you leave not during peak period. Like, why not charge extra for parking if people are contributing to the, the traffic congestion? So there are a, a whole array of parking management solutions that would probably be by far the most cost-effective way of solving the in-town traffic congestion problem. But at the same time, we need to look really carefully at supply. So adding more supply in the center of town is certainly making parking a lot more convenient for the user, and it saves you on operating costs for having to run shuttles or gondolas to some remote parking lot. So there, there's a lot of really good reasons to have a significant parking supply in town, and particularly to size the parking supply in town for the shoulder and uh, off-peak seasons. Right? That's a really good supply of parking to have. But for the peak, having more of your peak parking supply at the edges of town, where people don't have to drive through the most congested part of town in order to get to that parking, is also, I think, a critical part of your congestion management strategy. You can't have more parking in town than you have roadway capacity to get to that parking. So we need to think carefully about what's the optimal supply of parking in town, and where does that parking go for overflow when there's no longer enough roadway capacity to serve more parking. And that's one of the reasons why we're particularly interested in the ice rink and in the airport lot, as the potential peak season supply, and then finding a way of getting people to and from that supply efficiently. Because if the buses are stuck in traffic congestion, that's also not working from a customer experience standpoint. Well, again, alerting people that, hey, the in-town parking is full. Exactly. Right. And so the other, the, the other thing that we note is that um, for these, so uh, it's uh, parking structures are expensive. Like just a big rectangular lot, it, it, a structure is going to cost about $30,000 per parking space. Now, as your parking structure gets not quite rectangular or awkwardly shaped or shorter, uh, the cost per space rises rapidly. And if you're building that on an existing surface lot like F lot, the cost per net space turns out to be about $100,000 per parking space, right? I can guarantee you that it is going to be a lot cheaper to meet the parking and access and mobility needs for your employees and guests and whoever through a whole long list of other things than it is to spend $100,000 per parking space. And I can also tell you that it's a lot cheaper to invest in technology to help motorists find the closest available space um, and to make it really easy for them to secure that space than it is to you know, build parking at that rate. So there's a, there's a whole package of stuff that we want to develop for you and we're going to ask you more detailed questions about later but what's the right parking approach for Breckenridge? Recognizing that parking may be the most controversial topic that you have to deal with. It is very emotional. People have strong feelings about the relationship of parking between town character that we don't want to you know, uh, push too hard against. But we also need to recognize that it's expensive and that parking is your best congestion management tool. So uh, another thing we also want to recognize, as Bill alluded to earlier, is that 
Um, affordable housing and other services in town can also be an incredibly powerful congestion management tool. Every employee that no longer has to drive into town but can live here um, is a trip removed from the roads at peak, right? It's a, it's a great strategy and also creates co-benefits for maintaining the, the, the quality of this place, that the people who work here can afford to live here as well and that it's not just for visitors. But the, the real part of this conversation is the next part. So as I said earlier, we have some choice exercises up in the walls that we need your help with. So what you see in the walls is uh, what we went through in this morning's exercise, where we presented some, uh, some, some tensions to the group and, and asked, should we emphasize this more than that? Should we do this extreme or that extreme or go somewhere in the middle? What should we do first and what should we do second? Um, recognizing that there's no perfect solution and that we really need to tailor the solutions for what's appropriate today in Breckenridge. So as I mentioned, parking is a huge topic. We can either focus on increasing capacity or we can focus on managing demand. Um, in fact, I would argue that managing demand is a prerequisite before you add capacity. Like there's no point in adding capacity until you've got good management of the existing supply. I should, I, I'm supposed to be, I don't know, like letting you make this decision, but this is one area where I think Breckenridge, um, it's important for the town to step it up and I've got a, a strong recommendation on this one. The others I'm more agnostic about. Um, Park Avenue is another interesting question. So we, there are certain things that we can do uh, that can optimize traffic flow on Park Avenue. We can widen it to four lanes. We can spend a lot of money on intersections, either signals or um, uh, roundabouts, or we can start first on optimizing the pedestrian and bike experience, making it easier to get across park um, or walk or bike along it. Um, we can do both of these things, but we need to know what to do first. And to a certain degree, these are intention that accommodating more traffic on park is making it harder to walk across park. So some of them are in alignment, some aspects are in tension with each other. Yes, sir. and coming from other parts of the Have we been able, how much data have we been able to get to guess at this? We don't have this? a lot of data on that. We did a survey uh, back in 2013, 2014, and um, kind of what that told us is it's a, a bit of both. We certainly have a, a significant number of longer stay guests, so more than just that day tripper, that will leave their parking, they'll, they'll drive into town to ski for the day, if they're not in a ski and ski out, they'll drive back to their unit, get changed, get showered, and then they'll drive back into town to have dinner. So from an educational perspective, there's a, a lot we can do with that, but there is some piece of that that's kind of a little bit of everybody contributing to that. What I would suspect is it's a little, it's a little bit of everyone, and that it's, it don't, uh, while the, you know, the giant gondola lot parking lots, you know, they're big and they're visible and you can see the queue, uh, coming out of them, uh, uh, don't overestimate their contribution compared to all of the little thousands of driveways sort of scattered all over the valley. Uh, could also be a larger percentage, even though they're less visible. And so, again, my, you know, my recommendation would be to, to focus on all of these trips rather than just to focus on a single market. Uh, so another tension uh, or prioritization that we need some advice on is for getting around town. So with one side being, you know, uh, uh, increasing traffic capacity, building more convenient close-in parking in town itself as the priority, or first focusing on improving transit, improving biking and walking for those short trips in and around town. Uh, and there's certainly a uh, key tension between these two objectives, uh, both in terms of them competing against each other, but also in terms of them competing for scarce resources, because uh, we can spend a lot of money on both of those. Uh, another question about land use 
Um, the town owns a lot of land uh, scattered throughout the town. Um, what's the highest and best use of those parcels of land? Uh, should F lot be a parking garage? Should it be affordable housing? Should it be something else? Should it be a you know, gondola station? Uh, you know, East Sawmill, is, it's sort of long and narrow. It's a great parcel right on the river. Should it be parking? Should it be commercial? Should it be river restoration? Um, these are all things that we really need to hear from you that we have no opinion on that it really should reflect your town values. Uh, versus um, uh, focusing, you know, the, t the, the, you know, these parcels on, you know, art and open space and uh, other activities. Whoops. And that's it. So, um, so we've got three stations around the room. Each of these is identical. Uh, and what we really want to do is to hear from all of you. And there's a couple of exercises we'd like you to do. So as you can see from this morning, people put little green dots to tell us sort of where on the specta spectrum between these two opposite poles should we fall? And we got really good guidance. Um, in fact, um, there's a, there was an interesting spread on every single one. On some, people tended to cluster more on one end or the other. And a couple people were across the board. But one of the things that was really interesting to us is that on none of them was the community hitting polar opposites. This is really good news to us, that there was clear clustering on each. And in many cases, folks just wanted more information. So that's part one of the exercise. And part two of the exercise is to take a pen because one of the things that folks were telling us this morning is, well, I like, I really want some things on the left side, and I want some specific things on the right side, and I don't want these. Like, don't ever give me these. So put an X on the specific ideas that you don't want, and put a check mark on the specific ideas that you do want. This will allow us, you know, this isn't voting. We're not going to, you know, you don't have information about how much this costs and what the real benefit is. We're gauging the temperature of the town to see where there is consensus, and if there, where there is consensus, that's incredibly helpful to us, and where there's disagreement so that we can focus our resources on providing additional analysis on where there's disagreement in order to see if it's possible to come to agreement. 